Welcome to the first of a new series of Sociology Screencasts focusing on the Youth Culture section of the SY1 paper. So in the summer you're going to be sitting two written examinations that make up uh, the AS Sociology qualification and the first exam paper uh, that you will sit, SY1, has two sections to it. So the first section is the introductory core. So this is the material that we've already covered uh, particularly the stuff that we've looked at on culture, socialisation and social control are going to come up on the first section of that paper. The second section of SY1, we're going to start to apply many of the key concepts and theories from the introductory core to a particular topic called youth culture. So let me begin just by giving you a brief overview of this new topic called youth culture. So what we're going to do in this particular screencast is focus on some of the key concepts that underpin this new topic area. And then in the screencast after that, we start to focus on some of the early research that was done on youth cultures, focusing particularly on the concept of youth subcultures. Then we look at some of the more recent research that's been carried out on youth culture. And some of this recent research has called into question whether or not the concept of a subculture is any longer useful for helping us to understand the experiences of young people. And also when we're looking at more recent approaches to the study of youth culture, uh, we consider the globalisation of youth culture and the influence of wireless communication. So the influence of things like uh, mobile phones on contemporary youth subcultures. And then to round off uh, this particular topic, uh, we'll look at how uh, youth culture is often associated with crime, uh, deviancy and delinquent behaviour. And then finally, as young people spend a lot of their time in uh, formal educational institutions, we will conclude this topic by examining youth culture within the context of schools. So in this introductory screencast, I'm going to introduce you to three basic concepts. We're going to look at the concept of youth, the concept of a youth culture, and finally we'll look at the concept of distinctive youth subcultures. And youth can be defined as the period between puberty and the attainment of full adult status. Now in many traditional pre-industrial societies, Initiation into the status of a young adult comes fairly soon after the onset of puberty. So girls may get married and take on domestic responsibilities at quite a young age. Boys may become young warriors at quite a young age. In contrast, in modern Western societies, such as the UK, young people may have to wait a long time between reaching physical maturity and achieving full adult status. And this is often only uh, attained when a young person uh, gets to own their own home, uh, gets a job and gains financial independence from their parents. So in modern Western society such as the UK, uh, youth is viewed as an in-between, or to use the jargon, uh, a liminal category uh, between childhood and adulthood. So teenagers uh, hover uh, between childhood and adulthood. So teenagers often try uh, to follow adult ways, but they're treated in law as children. Uh, teenagers might wish to go to work, but they're constrained to stay in school. So youth occupies this uh, ambiguous uh, status in between uh, childhood and adulthood in modern Western societies. And youth as a distinctive social category is often seen as being inherently troublesome and problematic and as requiring services designed to meet its specific needs. For example, young people are often seen as being inherently uh, more deviant uh, than other sections of society. Now there are two broad perspectives that one might take on the experience of youth and one perspective uh, that is very popular is the biological perspective and this is a perspective uh, that sees adolescence as inevitably uh, a difficult period of transition for young people 
because of the biological changes that are associated with puberty. So this view was uh, popularised at the turn of the 20th century uh, by G. Stanley Hall, who suggested that puberty led to things like greater aggression, a greater awareness of sexuality, which meant that adolescence, in his view, was inevitably a period of storm and stress. However, sociologists and anthropologists have often challenged this biological view of adolescence that sees it as uh, an inevitable time of storm and stress. And sociologists and anthropologists have argued that the experience of youth varies greatly uh, across cultures and across time within the same culture and that it's not inevitably uh, a period of storm and stress. So from this perspective, the changes that we associate uh, with the period of life that we call youth are primarily uh, a social construction. They're primarily down to culture and to socialisation uh, rather than to biological factors. For example, Margaret Mead, who was an anthropologist, suggested that the difficulties associated with adolescence in Western society, such as America, had much more to do with the role assigned to young people uh, within those societies than with the biological changes involved in puberty. So Mead argued that in Western societies, teenagers have to endure a long period in which they are neither children uh, nor adults and they are not required to take on the responsibilities of adulthood, uh, but they're also excluded from many of its privileges. And Mead suggests that this ambiguous status occupied uh, by teenagers in countries like America produces the storm and stress. And in contrast to the experiences of American teenagers, uh, Margaret Mead, in this famous book, Coming of Age uh, in Samoa, uh, described how in Samoa, teenage girls were expected to take on responsibility for many of uh, the activities associated with adult women uh, in our society. So, for example, washing, cooking, uh, looking after younger children. And Mead argued that girls of this age uh, were also able to enter into sexual relationships much earlier than was common uh, in the West at the time that she was writing in the 1920s. And she argued that Samoan girls uh, seem to have fewer problems in moving through adolescence uh, into adulthood in comparison to American teenagers. And even within our own society, the concept of youth as a distinctive social category with special characteristics of its own is a relatively new idea and probably can be traced back to some of the key changes that occurred in British society uh, during the 19th century. So these changes that affected the status of young people included things like legislation, so what we mean here are laws that protected children and young people, uh, for example the prohibition on um, many forms of child labour uh, which created more opportunities for young people uh, to engage in leisure, uh, the extension of schooling for young people during the 19th century, uh, the growth of scientific knowledge, so you begin to get uh, psychological and medical perspectives on uh, the particular problems that young people uh, experience. And also towards the end of the 19th century, you start to get uh, media representations of young people as a problem, as inherently uh, deviant and a threat to social order. OK, let's now look at this second key concept that I want to cover, the concept of a youth culture. So youth culture is the idea that because young people uh, are now seen as a distinctive social category, that they developed uh, a shared way of life which is different to that of either children um, or adults. So it's the idea that uh, young people possess many norms and values uh, which are distinctive. Uh, and youth culture, in particular, is often based around uh, particular forms of music, particular forms of fashion, uh, particular forms of slang, and, and a desire for greater independence and freedom. And sociologists first reported on youth culture uh, within the UK 
in the 1950s and the 1960s when older teenagers moving into employment began to benefit from the relative post-war affluence. So after World War II, uh, the economy grew, people's wages grew, and lots of young people were able to use uh, their wages uh, to buy uh, fashionable clothes, pop records, and other products in the emerging youth culture market. And also, because of a demographic bulge in the post-war uh, youth population, uh, because of the so-called um, uh, baby boomers, uh, youth became highly visible in the post-war period. And this started to generate broad and often exaggerated social anxiety uh, from older people within society. So the development of what came to be known as a generation gap in which the young appeared to have different values, different interests from their parents' generation uh, started to emerge as the 1950s progressed and came to fruition in the uh, youth cultures of the 1960s as this bold generation of baby boomers reached the age of majority. Now the last concept that I want to take a look at briefly is the concept of a youth subculture. So the term youth culture refers to all young people whereas this term subculture refers to particular groups of young people. In other words a subculture is a group within a group. So within youth culture there are of course many distinct and constantly changing uh, youth subcultures and these particular subcultures often have uh, very different norms, values, behaviours and styles that vary quite widely. And very often uh, distinctive youth subcultures are viewed as being highly deviant from the perspective of mainstream society. So although all young people uh, share certain features and characteristics in common, um, we can also identify and explain the behaviour of different youth groups within this category on the basis of their particular subcultural characteristics. And subcultures are often based on uh, social factors such as people's social class background, their gender, their ethnicity, uh, where they live in the country and so on. And the sociologist Paul Hodgkinson, uh, based on research that he did on the uh, goth youth subculture, has identified uh, three key features that youth subcultures share. Firstly, there's the importance that youth cultures uh, attach to developing a very distinctive style. So if we take the goth youth subculture, even though there's some diversity uh, within the subculture, Goths are relatively easy to recognise as belonging to that particular subculture. Secondly, there's the idea of being committed to the subculture. So members are committed to their group uh, to the extent that it influences their lifestyle and their everyday life. So to influence the choices that they make about the clothes that they wear, the music that they listen to, uh, where they go out, the friends that they develop. And thirdly, members of a distinctive youth subculture, like the goth uh, youth subculture, have a strong sense of group identity. So members must feel that they're part of the group and see themselves to some extent as being different from outsiders. So in other words, membership of a youth subculture is a primary source of identification for the young people that are involved in it. Now, early sociological research on youth subcultures tended to focus on the more spectacular street-based youth subcultures. So these were subcultures where the participants uh, dressed in flamboyant ways, were noisy in public places and appeared to behave uh, in a defiant way uh, to attract uh, attention. And in class, so that you've got some important background knowledge on the development of uh, youth culture, we'll look at some uh, case studies, some particular examples of some of the spectacular youth subcultures uh, that emerged in Britain uh, in the post-war period.